All right, today on Flywire, we're actually going to do a then and now. Uh, I'm on Oahu, Hawaii, and we're going to look at World War II sites that uh, were uh, pivotal in the December 7, 1941 attack. Uh, tell the story a little bit about the, uh, about the attack and uh, take a look at what these sites look like now. Stick with me on Flywire. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to talk about the December 7th, 1941 attack, and uh, we're going to look at then and now sites. So we're going to go around Oahu and look at some of the important sites and uh, and see what they look like now and start try to put the, stitch together the story. And where I am right now is the Opana, uh, the road to the Opana uh, radar site, uh, which is right up that ridgeline, right up here. And uh, you can't see much of it. You can see the road's blocked behind me so we can't get there, but at, uh, what is it, so about 3.40 in the morning, they actually spotted a midget submarine uh, conning tower, and at 6.45 in the morning on December 7th, the ward uh, engaged that submarine, shot at it with, I believe, their five-inch guns, perhaps, and death charged it and sank it, and then they reported it to, uh, to their uh, higher uh, uh, authority, and it started trickling up to... Uh, um, uh, Admiral Kimmel, um, so, and he finally made was made aware of uh, the attack. Well, he was waiting for confirmation, but he was made aware of the attack, uh, waiting for that com confirmation while he was getting dressed when the actual bombing started. But at uh, that, the engagement of the mini sub. The midget submarine happened at 6.45, and at uh, 7.02, I believe it is, there were two privates in the radar site up here on the hill, on the Opana Hill, uh, overlooking the ocean, and they were looking this way, basically to uh, somewhere more or less in the in the north northwest uh, area, and the they saw a very large blip of airplanes, and uh, those airplanes, they got excited about it, and they called in to their uh, controlling zone or office, which was in Fort Shafter down in Honolulu, and uh, the officer on deck at that time, uh, on duty at that time, ba said basically, I don't worry about it, and uh, McDonald, the uh, guy working the desk, called back and talked to Lockhart and Elliot, and the two privates running the Opana radar site, and uh, they they said, yeah, yeah, this is the largest number of airplanes we've ever seen before, and they were very excited about it. And then uh, McDonald talked to the lieutenant again, uh, and the lieutenant said, yeah, don't worry about it. It's probably some B-17s inbound, and uh, then so they didn't do anything about it. And that was uh, at 7.40, they stopped worrying about it, and uh, then the, the bombing, really you could say they started strafing uh, Wheeler and Schofield Barracks at about uh, 7.48, and then the bombing started at about 7.55 uh, at Pearl Harbor. So arguably you could say this right here, right up this hill, uh, Opana Hill, is where World War II started for uh, us, uh, for, the, for America. So that's how I'm going to take a look at this. We'll take a look, a, a little bit deeper look at uh, each one of these sites and tell the story as we go. So hang on. Hey, I'm here at the uh, Wheeler Army Airfield, and this is basically where the, you don't want to argue that these were the first shots the Japanese fired on Americans in World War II. Uh, so after they, uh, they actually, the strike group actually coasted in somewhere around the Opana uh, radar site actually and they split into three strike groups one in, went east one went west and one came down the valley and the first target in the valley was Wheeler Army Airfield that's that's right here and uh, I was hoping to get to see some of the battle damage that's supposedly uh, rumored to still be here but I couldn't get there they're still using the base and you can't get on the flight line it's kind of a regular thing most of the a lot of sites you can't get to unless they're on Navy bases so um, anyway, uh, here at Wheeler, what happened is, is the Japanese, uh, they had two main, main objectives, it appears to me. The, one was air power. They wanted to neutralize as much possible air power as they could. And uh, so they struck Wheeler, where they had a whole bunch of P-40s and things like that. Uh, Sands about, I want to say, 8 to rumors 12 to maybe 14 P-40s and then some P-36s at uh, that Haleawa airfield. Uh, they didn't, the Japanese didn't 
didn't know about it. They didn't have intel on that. So uh, they targeted here and all the P-40s, and they shot it up pretty good. Uh, and then they, they went on to uh, Pearl Harbor. The Eastern Group actually uh, sent a sub-strike group to uh, Kanoe Bay, the Marine Corps Air Station there, and shot that up and then continued on to Hickam. And the Western Group then circled around, and they're the ones that, uh, that attacked Pearl Harbor mainly. Pearl Harbor just seemed like there were uh, the main objective there was uh, uh, the battleships. Okay, the carriers were not there, so they wanted to target them. They they weren't there. They were off on training missions or delivering fighters, other airplanes to Midway. So uh, they concentrated on the battleships and uh, sunk eight, you know, eight of them. Um, there's two that uh, were left, and we'll talk about that when we get that were that are still there actually, and uh, we'll talk about that when we t get to Fort Island. But um, right here, uh, well, after Wheeler, they they then targeted Hickam and uh, all in told, I want and Fort Island, and uh, those are mostly the fighters, and they had dive bombers, and they had uh, level bombers, and they had torpedo bombers. One of the interesting thing is is that the the Americans believed, I think the general depth was around 48 feet or so in uh, Pearl Harbor, and they believed that nobody could uh, drop a torpedo in those waters, so they weren't worried about it. Uh, it turns out that the Japanese actually had perfected uh, shallow water torpedoes, and the Americans had not. And the Japanese torpedoes were much better than Americans, and the American torpedo was not great at the beginning of the war, and uh, that's just a reality of it. So this is Wheeler. And as I said, uh, you, you can't really get to see anything of uh, historical importance, but the buildings are all pretty cool. They're uh, more in the style of uh, uh, the uh, Art Deco sort of uh, thing from the 30s, which is about the time they built this. So on to, uh, I think, Fort Island next. Take a quick spin over uh, Bellows uh, Field. This is on the northeast side of Oahu. Uh, it was also a, a strip that was attacked on December 7th, 1941, and there were a few airplanes there. The importance of Bellows Beach, uh, or Bellows Field, is it was a, a big reliever. This is the bivouac area. Big reliever for uh, the Pearl Harbor area, Hickam and, and so on. This is an overhead shot. The uh, importance there, as you can see, that beach is they use this for... Uh, uh, training. They also used it as a staging base. I believe these are P-41s or P-47s headed for uh, uh, the South Pacific. And you can see another shot here of uh, uh, B the, some B-25s uh, on a cross runway. But they used that beach as a training uh, area for uh, amphibious landings. So the Marines would get used to what it's like to hit the beach uh, before somebody starts shooting at them. So better to learn in a more benign environment than uh, when people are shooting at you. Uh, Maui was also used for that purpose. Um, so you can see this is a, that's the setup. The next shot here is the midget submarine that landed, uh, washed ashore on Bellows Beach on December 8th, the morning of December 8th. And uh, one of the sailors was taken prisoner of war. This uh, submarine is now on display at the uh, National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. I'm going to take a quick spin around Fort Island here. This is the uh, island when it was uh, native owned before it was uh, deeded to the uh, uh, government, U.S. government. Um, some of these sites you can see on Fort Island only if you have uh, military ID. Others you can go from the uh, uh, Arizona Memorial Tour area to uh, go over and look at the uh, Missouri and the, the uh, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. This is when Fort Island was owned by the uh, and operated by the Army. Um, you can see the hangars and everything. There's a landing field there and a hand-drawn sketch of uh, Fort Island and some of the development plans pretty early. This is when the Navy controlled uh, Fort Island. You can see Battleship Row at the top and the carrier locations down on the bottom. Uh, this is uh, Fort Island. Um, unclear whether this was taken after the uh, attack. This is, it says, never called Loop Field. Actually, the, when the Army operated the uh, island, it was called Loop Field. The Navy did not call it that. They just called it Fort Island. This is the paved uh, runway. Uh, it's too small for the operations. Uh, this is a look at Pearl Harbor uh, looking at Pearl Harbor with Hickam at the top. 
Kitabotai, the uh, six carrier attack Japanese task force, this is their path for the attack and the recovery. The staging area before the uh, carriers, uh, the Kitabotai, started out for the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor attack. And this is the attack plan. You can see they're heavily concentrated on Battleship Row. They were a battleship navy and they thought that was the biggest threat, carriers being the next threat. This is a briefing just before takeoff on the Akagi. Another shot of the Akagi uh, with a zero prep for a takeoff there. Um, this is a shot of uh, the zeros running up on the Akagi. It's unclear whether this is the, the actual attack because it took the takeoffs took off place at night. Phase one or wave one on the left, wave two you can see on the right. This is shortly after the attack began. Uh, bomb drop miss, and you can see a torpedo line going to one of the carriers. Shot of the opposite side looking at Battleship Row in the mainland, and a bomb had just been dropped. Uh, same shot from a different perspective. Uh, you can see a dive bomber pulling off there in the second water plume. Uh, level dive bomber or level bomber overhead, um, Hickam looking at Pearl or Fort Island. This is, the, I love this shot, this shows all the flak, so the, uh, and some of the ships burning in Pearl Harbor. Another shot of Fort Island. This is the West Virginia um, uh, foundered, uh, flag still flying, and the uh, ship next to it burning. This is the Arizona uh, Ford ammunition magazine had just exploded, and then here's a color shot of the same thing from a slightly different perspective. The ship sank right after that, killing 1,177 sailors. Seaplane base looking at the dry docks. Likely that um, explosion there is from the two car or cruiser or destroyers that were in that dry dock that were destroyed. Seaplane base. And the recovery started here, but you can see they haven't put out all the fires that are eating up that hangar. This is after the sh after the attack, and you can see how the damage to that those hangars on the left haven't been fully repaired. Battleship Row um, showing some of the uh, well, one of the ships in, started to founder, and this is that dry dock I was mentioning. Cruiser in the background is barely damaged, but the two destroyers in the front were pretty much destroyed. Another shot of Battleship, battleship Row uh, with the, the battleships burning. And that's the West Virginia rescue. Another sh the color shot, slightly different perspective of the same, uh, the same thing. This is the Utah. It uh, capsized, and there were sailors trapped uh, underneath it there and inside that hull, and they're trying to get them out. This is the Utah today. It's still there, and you can see that it's pretty much rusted out. Not much left. Seaplane base that we just saw a little earlier looking towards that dry dock. And it's been fully repaired. That's what it looks like today. Right behind the seaplane base, there's uh, this hangar, which was barely damaged in uh, the, the uh, attacks. That's the tower for Fort Island. And we're looking at the uh, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, panning over to Hangar 79. And the seaplane base is just to the left of that. This is panning across the field, airfield, looking at the opposite side of Fort Island. The Utah is right behind that white hangar there on the left. This is Hangar 79, and there's still some pretty cool uh, <laughs> battle damage uh, there, and we're going to take a look at that. Some you can see in the uh, on the concrete apron, uh, but they use this hangar. They don't, they don't, there's no aviation anymore, no flying, landing at uh, Fort Island. This is all uh, future displays and other artifacts that the museum has collected. The B-17C was apparently at Pearl Harbor during the attack and uh, it is later uh, did a forced landing in Indonesia and then recovered uh, quite a few years later and you can see the damage there it's a great display. A zero that was recovered and uh, now uh, I guess the plans are to, to restore it at some point and this is a view of the hangar doors all the blue glass was original the white glass was placed over it to protect it and they preserve the uh, bullet holes in the blue glass, which is actually reinforced glass. So that's why it didn't just pop it all out. Some of the other airplanes uh, on display there um, for the uh, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Pretty good collection. 
and we're going to go inside real quick here. This is a Japanese Zero that uh, crash landed on one of the out islands and it couldn't make it back and then was later recovered and restored. This is an F4F which was the mainstay combat fighter for the carriers uh, in the beginning of the war. The SPD was the pull the major offensive uh, uh, care, uh, capability for the carriers at the beginning of the war. The Army's uh, P-40, which was the advanced fighter uh, at Oahu. Memorial for Oklahoma sailors that were uh, killed during the attack. And it's right by the Missouri. And this is the Missouri tour map for it's a museum now, and you can go on it and use it for ceremonies or whatever you like. It's just a, a tremendous thing. This is the stern of Missouri, and Missouri was the uh, flagship and took the surrender of the Japanese at the end of the war in September of 45. This is the foredeck, and the next shot is uh, looking at, uh, that's the surrender deck actually. Uh, that's where the surrender happened, uh, right there behind those people. And um, here's a shot of the surrender itself, showing all the generals and admirals that were uh, pretty much uh, were players during the uh, Pacific War. And this is a shot of the foredeck looking at the Arizona. The Missouri is docked on Battleship Row, just south of the Arizona Memorial. And you can see the uh, slick of oil that's uh, still spilling out of uh, the Arizona Memorial. This is the conning tower for the uh, Missouri. I thought it was real interesting. That armor is really, really thick. Supposedly it'll protect you from the 16-inch shells of another battleship. This is a quick look at the elevator uh, uh, from the ammunition magazine for a 5-inch gun. Hey, I thought this was going to be really cool. This is the Haleawa uh, fighter strip. It's an auxiliary fighter strip. They, uh, it was a grass sand strip in uh, World War II. They started using it just before, uh, before the war as a austere training location. And then just before December 7th, 1941, the 47th Pursuit uh, Squadron, Fighter Squadron, at a Wheeler, uh, stationed eight P-40Bs here, and another squadron, I'm not sure which, uh, stationed two P-36 uh, airplane uh, fighters here. And it was a fighter strip. It was all grass and sand. Later in the war, very towards the end, they actually paved it. Uh, and during the attack, uh, supposedly two B-17s landed here instead of trying to make it to Hickam. Um, so down this road is that strip, and you can't, uh, I'll show you a picture. I, I walked on it, and uh, some people came up and threw me off. Uh, so it's private property. Can't go back there. But uh, the Haleawa fighter strip on December 7th, I think, is famous. Uh, it's too bad you can't go and look at it now. <clears throat> There's not much left, really. But... Uh, jungles reclaiming what uh, what's left but uh, on December 7th uh, George Welch and Ken Taylor were coming back from a uh, all-night party in Honolulu on Waikiki Beach and uh, I think this was during the first attack uh, first wave I wasn't able to piece together the timeline here but uh, the first wave they got to Wheeler and then called up the uh, the mechanics here at the Haleawa auxiliary strip and uh, had them refuel and rearm uh, two airplanes and then they rushed out here it took them about 15 minutes sick to to travel 16 miles so they were hauling butt for the roads in those days to get here and then they jumped in the airplanes and uh, ended up uh, shooting down, um, I want to say, either four or five airplanes. Uh, it depends on who, who you believe uh, the credits there uh, go. And then they landed later at Wheeler, or were landing at Wheeler, and uh, Welch shot down another airplane that was trying to shoot down Ken Taylor. They were able to refuel and rearm to some degree and, and got up and uh, uh, did some more work. Uh, at that point. So a couple other airplanes took off from here from the fighter strip and they uh, engaged what I believe is the second wave uh, and maybe the first wave on its return uh, from uh, the attack at Pearl Harbor because the valley is this way. Pearl Harbor Wheeler is just that way and the, the, the fighter strip here is on the northwest shore. Shows some overhead pictures. So this is what it looks like now. Can't go and see it. Uh, they had two guys that threw me off. So... <laughs> Anyway, let's go look at the next one. Okay, I'm at uh, Hickam Air Force Base. Uh, the Officers Club is just right over here. This is the Missing Man uh, Monument uh, Memorial here, and this is uh, the entrance to Pearl Harbor. Um, so I, I, there is some battle damage to some of the hangars, 
at Pearl and uh, I mean at Hickam here at, at uh, Pearl Harbor and I was going to try to see that but I can't get on flight line. <laughs> it's kind of my thing here. Uh, a lot of the places, uh, as I said, other than Navy, um, they're being used and they won't let you on. So what can you say? But uh, here at Hickam, I thought this would be a good place to shoot. So it is now 745 on a Sunday morning, uh, 83 years after the attack, and uh, give or take a few months. And uh, behind me right there uh, in the open ocean is where the word had taken a shot at one of the midget submarines about an hour ago. And about... Uh, uh, I want to say seven minutes ago or so, the, uh, the radar guys, they, they actually saw the uh, incoming uh, first wave, 183 Japanese airplanes in the first wave, and they uh, had seen them at 7.05 and um, bickering back and forth, and uh, oh yeah, it's B-17's coming in, don't do anything, it's no big deal. Um, at 7.40, they pretty much gave up. Uh, at 7.55, uh, coming from around the ridge line over here, I'll give you a pan so you can see it in a minute, but uh, coming around that ridge line over there, uh, the uh, wave, uh, first wave, and then down the valley right here, uh, right there, and then the other wave, uh, other segment of the first strike group over there where it hit uh, the Marine Corps Air Station at uh, Kanoe Bay and also Bellows Field. There was a small airstrip there. Uh, on the coast and the Air Force has an Air Force station there now no runway they do a lot of training there um, and we're going to take a look at that because that's where uh, actually I already saw it you already saw it but that's where that midget uh, submarine washed ashore on December 8th um, and uh, just after uh, uh, the next day so that was two of the midget submarines uh, the other three uh, were sunk uh, one of them actually, uh, the one in board engaged was sunk out there. Uh, there's one that actually made it through the entrance uh, to Pearl Harbor here, and there were submarine nets and uh, other things right out here. And it made it through that by following a ship, but then it got sunk by a destroyer uh, a little bit further into the harbor. Just around the corner of the, of, uh, the, the entry here is where Fort Island is. So... Let's see, there was, uh, like I said, 183 airplanes in the first wave, 170 uh, Japanese airplanes in the second wave, and um, it's, at Hickam, I want to say the, uh, the Army and the Army Air Forces, Air, Air Corps, lost about just over 500, 530-some-odd people uh, were uh, either wounded or killed in the attack, and the Navy lost over 2,000. Uh, 1177 in the Arizona alone. Um, so it was the the worst attack, the highest death rate uh, in, in a very very long time. Um, I think even World War One battles for the for the U.S. weren't that bad. But uh, anyway, that's uh, this is what it it was like. Uh, we're at uh, 750 now. Uh, 7:49, and we got another six minutes to go, and then this got this place got really, really busy, uh, 83 years ago. So, what I'm going to do next in the next video is I'm going to take a look at uh, the the <laughs> what went wrong. Why were uh, I mean they got alerted basically on the 27th of November uh, that there's going to be uh, an imminent uh, Japanese attack. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. Why were they not prepared? Why was there no other airplanes airborne? Why was it they weren't, weren't believing the radar? All those things, I'm going to go in the next video. Uh, it may not be released next week, but I'm going to do a, a video on that, so stand by for that. Hope you like this one. Then and now, uh, from what it was like and during the attack and what it's like now, 83 years later. So if you liked it, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd like to thank my Patreon reporters there as well. And what else can I say? There you have it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.